God created the heavens and the earth. God's people. I hope you got your Bibles. If not, use your cell phones. That'll work. We're going to be in three different texts today. In fact, um, sometimes it's a big deal just to read one text. Today we're going to be in three texts. Now, if you want to go to Genesis chapter 3, we'll be able to get this right. We're in, I know this is a big deal. We're in Genesis 3. And that, if you're new here and you're like, what, why is that a big deal? Because we've been in this series since September of last year. And we're only in the third chapter. So we're going through the entire book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and believe it or not, sometimes word by word. So at this rate, um, when we're done with the book of Genesis, well, we're trying to beat the rapture is what we're trying to do, okay? Um, (laughs) And so, (laughs) I wish we'd all been read, right? Like, uh, okay, so yes, we're in the third chapter today, and um, uh, if you want, once you get to Genesis 3, you can also go flip, if, if you've got a real, a real Bible, like, like one with like real paper, then you can actually also flip to Ezekiel 28 and put your finger in there. Again, Ezekiel 28. And then I'm also going to be in Isaiah 14. So that's like west side. Okay, awesome. And um, uh, if you don't want, if you just want to go to Genesis 3, you can do that, and then I'll put the scripture verses up on the screens, or my helper Daniel on media will, will put the verses up on the screens, um, which will be um, very, very, very great. Now, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the serpent, and this is going to be kind of difficult to do if you're married to the Walt Disney version of the Garden of Eden, and, you know, our God who created the heavens and the earth in six days, right? On the seventh day, God was exhausted, and so he took a nap. So Sabbath means nap time, right? And then he created a garden called the Garden of Eden, and in Eden, there was a good tree of life, and then there was a bad tree of death, which was actually an apple tree, and the apple tree had a snake, that apparently walked and talked. Hey, welcome to the apple tree. You should eat it. It's good. But God said, no, I know, but what does God know? You know, so, ah, (laughs) peewee, surf. Okay, (laughs) this is going to be a long message. No, really, it is going to be a long message. Okay, and um, so our Disney context for Eden has been shattered throughout this series. And if you are new, let me catch you up. So yes, God did create the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he didn't take a nap. No, on the seventh day, he came into his creation because this whole time he had not been creating the heavens and the earth, ultimately for man, but ultimately for himself. And so God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and, uh, and then he came into his temple. Now, the 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 garden, okay, was not Eden. He created Eden, and in Eden, it says that he planted a garden, okay? So what he actually had been doing, and this is what we've been studying, is that he has been creating for himself an abiding place. He's been creating for himself a temple. And then we've learned that Adam and Eve, he created them not just to be gardeners playing with dirt, but what he'd been doing was creating them to be priests, that they were to be priests ministering in the holy temple. So this is what we've been learning in our in our series. Now we know that yes, there were two trees in the garden. So you got a temple and t- what temples have, temples have temple gardens, okay? And so you we know that there were two trees, but it wasn't the good tree and the bad tree. You have the tree of life, okay, which was the tree that they were invited to eat of. 
And if they would eat of this tree, then they would have prolonged life. It was contingent immortality, contingent on them feasting on the tree of life, which is why Jesus says, I am the tree of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This bread is my body. Take and eat. This cup is my blood. Take and drink and do this often. In the same way that Adam and Eve would often participate of the tree of life, Jesus says, eat of me and do this often, and it would prolong life. Okay. But there was another tree in the garden, okay? and it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was not the tree of death, okay? Uh, This is what God says. If you eat of it, the consequence will be a death sentence. You will surely die. But that does not make it a tree of death. That's the consequence of eating of that tree. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was the tree of maturity. It was the tree of discernment. It was the tree of street smarts. And this is what God says. He says, you may eat of all the trees, especially the tree of life, but you do not need to eat of the tree of maturity. You do not need to eat of the tree of discernment. You don't need to eat of the tree of street smarts. Why? Because you got me. I'll be your papa. I'll be your source of discernment. I will be, you trust me. You eat of all the other trees. And, and, and you say, well, so you're saying that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was, was a good tree? Yes, because everything that God created was good. And if you're a parent, you'll know that there are some things that are good that you forbid from your children because it is a wise choice to forbid some good things from your children because they lack the maturity to engage with it. So here we have two trees in the garden, the tree of life, okay? And then we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's what brings us to our text today and the study of the serpent. Who, who was this talking snake, okay? And what happens when God judges this talking snake? So this is what we're going to be looking at um, today. Now, in order to do this, okay, we have to see that Scripture interprets Scripture. So what we're going to be doing is diving into three various texts that deal with the Garden of Eden and deal with the serpent. So sometimes what we do is we only look at one particular text and we try to define it in isolation and we try to do it only purely through the English language. The problem with that, okay, is that the Bible, the, the origin of the Bible, Bible was was not English, okay? Um, our, our, our rich Hebraic faith does not come from America. No, the religion that comes from America is the religion of Mormonism, and no, Eden does not come from Missouri, just for the record. So, this will be a bit of a journey, okay? And I'm going to take you through a journey, and you're going to have to turn your brains on high. You're not going to want to be cruising Instagram on this one because you will get lost, okay? We're going to be literally hopscotching. We're going to be pogo sticking bet- between three texts. We're going to be jumping back and forth, and we're going to be diving into garden, into the garden, into Eden within these texts, and we're going to see the serpent. We're going to learn who the serpent was. And this is, this is, and this is kind of an interesting point. In the same way that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not necessarily evil, okay? In the same way, we're going to see that this serpent, in the same way, was not originally evil. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now, the serpent was made more crafty than any other beast of the field, and the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually I'm just kidding. All right. it, 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 will be, it will be here forever if I could. All right. So did God actually okay, say, um, <laughs> you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent. So we got, a, we got, a, we got ourselves a, ta- a talking serpent, and we've got ourselves the woman talking to the serpent. She, she responds, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit um, that is in the midst of the garden, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Okay, spoiler alert. She's going to eat of the apple. 
And then, and it's not an apple. She's going to eat of the tree, and then she's going to hand it to her husband. He's going to eat of it. So I'm sorry. If, if you don't know the story, I'm sorry. I just totally ruined it. But, but we will spend some time on temptation, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to fast forward now. We're going to see the consequences that come to the serpent um, for doing this. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. So that's where the snake loses its legs, right? And then on and onto his belly, and then in dust you shall eat. It sucks. All the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. Ezekiel 28, um, and I'm going to, uh, 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 let's see, I'm going to start Ezekiel 28, because your heart is proud, verse 2, you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods, and your heart of seas, and yet you are but a man and no God, and do, do me a favor and scroll all the way down um, Let's go to verse 12. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king and say to him, Thus says the Lord, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and, be- and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, big deal right there. Eden was not the garden of man. It was the garden of God that he included man and brought man into every precious stone was your covering sardis and topaz diamond beryl onyx jasper sapphire emerald and carbuncle and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings and the day that you were created they were prepared you were the anointed guardian cherub i placed you Okay, and you were on the holy mountain of God. And where was the holy mountain of God? Yep, in Eden. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. An abundance of your trade. You were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor I cast you to the crown to the ground and I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade you profaned your sanctuaries so I brought fire out from your midst and I consumed you I turned you to the ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you all who knew you among the peoples are appalled at you and you have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. Isaiah chapter 14, looking at verses 12 to 15. How are you? It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. Okay, so what do we have? Okay, um, we don't have an animal, we don't have a snake. We have a divine being. This is not a part of the animal kingdom, but he is a part of the kingdom of God. Hit pause. Nothing that I'm going to tell you uh, guys right now is mine. So I don't claim any sort of ownership over our, our study today. And what we're going to be looking at are some thoughts and ideas that are shared by Hebrew scholars. And this has been a, uh, a belief in church history for generations. And yet, oddly enough, I've never actually heard it taught on a Sunday morning. 
Furthermore, if you've, e- if, if you've ever tried to work through a commentary on the book of Genesis, they will usually avoid talking about who was the serpent and giving a greater context for the serpent. Usually what they want to do is they want to talk about what the serpent did, but they don't want to talk about who he was. So you need to know that, um, that I, I'm going to be bringing some things to you, but that I am not the origin um, of these things. Um, in fact, I've, uh, I've been getting um, uh, this material from multiple sources. And why is that important? Well, if you only subscribe to one thinker, you'll become a clone. But if you can subscribe to multiple streams and multiple sources and read as much as you can... Over time, with Holy Spirit, you can find your own voice. Now, um, throughout this series, I've been using, uh, you should check it out, YouTube, The Bible Project. There you'll, you can go and deep dive, and you can watch it with your kids. It's all animated. It's incredible. They'll dive into the Elohim. They'll dive into the divine council. Um, you can dive into Genesis, the tree of life. It's really well done, and it's all um, being used and interpreted from the Hebraic text. Um, I'm also going through Hillsdale Bible College has a course on Genesis as well that has been incredibly helpful. I've also been using the Passion Translation um, and uh, Brian Simmons and his footnotes. It's a lot of Passion Translation that we've been using for our children's study. So your children will actually be studying the dynamics of the personhood of, of, of the serpent even this morning. So our children are studying the same text as us which is pretty cool. So have, have some conversations with your kids, okay, about what we're studying together. And a large portion, okay, of what I'm using today is from a brilliant scholar named Michael Heiser. And he has an incredible book where he goes into a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. And it's called Unseen Realms. And uh, it, it's very, very dense, um, but it's, 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 very, it's, it's very, very interesting. As we've been talking about Eden being a temple dynamic, as being the dwelling place of God, as being the abiding place of God, that is not a controversial thought. It's just not taught in the church. So there, there are really no Hebrew scholars that I know of that will push back on the idea of Eden being this place of, a, of, of, of the abiding place of, of God. Okay, so uh, now we're going to continue here. I just wanted to kind of give you some, some sources in case you want to continue your study. And here's the other thing I just want to say really quick. Um, this is not an elementary um, study of Genesis. And so if you've been a part of this series, you have a greater understanding of the creation account and the book of Genesis that would be far deeper than the majority of the church. And I'm not saying that to puff you up. I'm saying that that you'd have a confidence in what you are studying so that you can really own it, you can really pray into it, you can really wrestle with the text so that you can also bring understanding to people that might have struggled with Genesis in the past. Okay, and so um, anyways, here we go. You guys ready? Okay, all right. The serpent, okay, was a, a divine being, okay, not a snake, and associated with the divine council. We have not really dove into the divine council. I'm gonna bring some definition for what that is. Okay, we're a charismatic church. We believe in realms. We believe in a supernatural realm or a spiritual realm, a heavenly realm. So there's this realm of of time, space, and earth that we engage with. There's also a heavenly realm, and within this heavenly realm or unseen realm are, yep, angels and demons. We see throughout Genesis and throughout the Hebraic literature this idea of the divine counsel of God. It's also called the sons of God. They are also referred to as rulers and authorities. This divine counsel is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, and it's called the host of heaven. Moses would talk about their signs, speaking of their power and their status, always pointing, as a good sign does, always pointing to Yahweh Elohim, or mighty God, okay? These, this divine council, okay, they are appointed to rule over the day and the night. There are stories in the Bible where God invites his divine council to come and participate in decisions. For example, there's a story in the Bible where the Lord invites his divine council to come and give input into how to deal with the corrupt Israelite king Ahab. 
In Job, God debates his divine counsel on how to reward people who are doing good. So this divine counsel, it's like God's executive staff team. And in the very beginning, we see that the God, okay, Yahweh Elohim, is so courageous and so humble in his leadership that he shares his authority with, the, with his divine counsel, with the sons of God. He shares his authority in the heavenly realm. That's pretty awesome. In the same way, when he creates Adam, when he creates humanity in his own image and likeness, he also begins to share his authority in the earthly realm. Okay? Now, we see that uh, there is this incredible partnership between heaven and earth that takes place. And we see that men are free to choose to partner with God's plan for humanity, and men are free to oppose God's plan for humanity. So, let's dive into Eden. Eden is described in a similar ways as the temple is described, or the tabernacle. Eden is called the dwelling place of God. It's where God is. And Eden is where the divine counsel of God is as well. So, Eden was God's headquarters, his divine dwelling. And what does it look like? Well, it looks just like a lot of other religions would say where their gods live. Because in this period of time, you have people that are living out in the Middle East, and so where would their gods live? In very lush, well-watered, and mountainous regions, gods always lived on the mountains. Mountains um, were symbolic and significant of the separation between God and man, because there wasn't really good climbing equipment back then. Okay, so here we see Eden, and Eden is a mountain. It's the dwelling place of God. And here within this dwelling place is a serpent, a divine being, and it's masquerading as an animal. Oh, yeah. And it talks. Oh, yeah. And it's really, 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 really smart. Isn't that funny that Moses says, and here's this, you know, we think of it, and here's this talking snake who's really crafty. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've never looked at an animal and been like, Man, I bet you the IQ on that animal is really, really high. Yeah, because this, this isn't an animal. This is a divine being. And it has a name. We call it serpent, but in the Hebrew, it's nakash. Okay? Now, nakash is made up of three Hebrew letters. And these letters are nun, chet, and shin. And what you have is three letters. You have a noun, a verb, and an adjective. The noun means serpent. So when these English translators were telling us what this creature was, they went with the noun. The problem is that's only one of the three letters for serpent. The verb means to deceive or practice divination. It implies a deceiver having divine knowledge. And we see here that this deceiving divine being is going to use its divine knowledge to manipulate mankind. And then we have an adjective, okay? We've got a noun, a serpent, okay? We've got um, the verb, to deceive. And then we've got the adjective, and the adjective means bronze or bronzish, meaning shining one. The definite article here for Nahash is the shining one. And we've got to factor this into it. So shining or luminosity is applied to divine beings. And we'll be looking at uh, this idea of these divine beings. They were luminous. They were shining. They had divine knowledge. Okay? We take this luminosity idea, this glowing one idea, and we see this fact that Eve, she responds to this serpent. She's talking with this serpent. And so if, if we thought that this thing was this big, evil, dark, demonic thing, and the, you know, like, like if we were to read this in the context that we normally understand it, then, then here is Eve, and she just so happens to be walking by, you know, uh, the tree, when all of a sudden we hear, <laughs> Dun, dun, 
Now, if that had happened, if there was this big, dark, evil, dragonous entity that came out and said, and his little eyes started doing this, you know, he would be like, yeah, no, thank you. Deuces, peace out. Right? No, here's this divine being, and Eve's like, oh, hey, you silly. What are you up? You know, they, they go, they have this conversation, and that needs to get our, our attention. Now, in Isaiah 6, and we didn't read Isaiah 6. We don't need to. Many of you will be familiar with Isaiah 6. That's, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the You know, it's the Lord takes the coal and cleanses it to his lips. There is mention there of here is mighty God, and, and here is his presence. And here within the presence of mighty God is a seraph or a seraphim. What does that mean? Here is this being there, right there, in the presence of mighty God, and it's shining, it's blazing. The name means to burn. It's a burning one. Seraph, it's a noun. Guess what it means as well? Serpent. The seraph wasn't just a serpent. It was a guardian serpent. Um, we, we see that it was a throne room guardian. And what's interesting is that when you look at the various languages, when you look at the Egyptian language and how it refers to this being, it contrasts with the Assyrian or Phoenician definition for this word. So we, sometimes we see this word um, seraph, okay, burning one, this, this um, burning entity, this guardian serpent, and other times it's referred to as a cherub. So the same word can be translated differently depending on the audience that, um, that, that, depending on the author that authors these texts. So here we have Genesis 3, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. They're referring to the same serpent being, and they are referring to Eden. Isn't this fascinating? We have a book called the Bible, 66 different books in the Bible, written over 1,400 years by over 40 authors, and the books all complement each other and weave together one storyline. To me, that is proof that we have a timeless record that does not need to be adapted by a liberal culture. We have a timeless record administrated by prophets of old and overseen by the Lord Jesus Christ, this record of our origin story. And when we forget our past, we will abdicate our destiny. And what's fascinating is we begin to read this text. Here's what's happening. Here's Eden. It's a divine throne room. And the throne room has a throne guardian. A cherub, a seraph, a serpentine guardian who has, who is existing in proximity to God, a role in the divine council in Eden who decides to deceive humanity and get rid of them. Now, this is where it's going to get a little tricky, and this is where it's going to get a little jumpy. You guys got your jumping shoes on? Because now we're going to begin jumping from text to text and seeing this picture that gets created. The text is between Genesis 3, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28. We see this divine council and a divine council member. And within the prophets, they record of evil tyrant kings whose pride is described in terms of an ancient story about a divine being who fell from paradise due to rebellion against God. This tale references Eden directly in Ezekiel's case, and it references Eden indirectly in Isaiah's case. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have the Nakash, the shining one. And where is he? He's in the temple. He is in the council of God, in the garden of Eden. Now, Daniel, let's go Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Ezekiel 28, verse 12 says this. You, speaking of the serpent, were the signet of perfection. 
And many of us immediately think of a signet ring. But the context here is not speaking of a ring. In fact, interpreters say that this word for signet should be properly translated serpent. And here Ezekiel would be saying, you were the serpent of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. And every precious stone was your covering. You were the shining cherub. He was the anointed cherub. He was the throne guardian. In Isaiah 6, it says that the throne guardian is a seraph, the seraphim, this word serpent. And we see throughout the text, when we see a seraph or a cherub, this word scholars say, now, I realize that in our, tr in our tradition, which is very revelatory, this makes me a little nervous sometimes, we have a lot of people that see heavenly beings and encounter, and they give encounter identity to these beings. But what, what, what Hebraic linguists tell us is that by language, these terms are interchangeable. And that might create some tension if you're like, yeah, well, this, this person went to heaven and engaged with this kind of... I'm just saying in terms of the language that scholars say that the cherub can be used as the same word as seraph. So here's this being. It's a divine being, being in Eden, in the garden of God, literally clothed in precious stones, the sardis, the topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, and emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were the settings and your engravings. And on the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed cherub, and I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. Now let's jump. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. This is what it says. O shining one, son of the dawn. Now this, this term, the shining one, is the Hebrew term where we get the term Lucifer. So Lucifer is the Latin Vulgate definition of Hallel. The name Lucifer is actually nowhere in the Bible. What you have is the shining one, the luminescent one. And we see that this term is used of this guardian cherub within this text. Now let's jump, you little jumper, you, back to Genesis 3. The glowing one says to Eve, you're not going to die. You will become like one of the Elohim. You will become like one of us. He, he knows that if you eat of this fruit, it's not going to kill you. It's going to transfigure you into the divine counsel. Let's go back to the animal thing. Snakes are not a part of the divine counsel. Snakes, lizards, iguanas, panda bears are not a part of the divine council. This is a divine being. It's luminescent. It's glowing. It's a burning one. Ezekiel 28 verse 14. You were an anointed cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. Here Ezekiel says that Eden is both a garden and a mountain. Eden is the holy mountain of God. And we see this anointed cherub, this serpent figure. And what's he doing? He's walking among the stones of fire in Eden. Here he is fixed on this cosmic mountain with the divine counsel. And we see this image of fire on the mountain that 
we can't help, when we hear this imagery, it immediately takes us to Mount Sinai and, and Moses and his encounter with the relational fire glory up on that mountain. Ezekiel 28, if you rewind, go to verse 1, it says, Because your heart is proud, you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, and in the heart of the seas, you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of God. This serpent being sees himself as God. He refers to himself as God. He sees himself in charge, and he says, I ought to be in charge. Jump back to Genesis 3. It manifests. How does it manifest? With this serpent cherub, this guardian seraphim, interfering with God's plan. Isaiah 14. The shining one wants to set his throne on the mountain of God. Isaiah 14 says this, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. That is above the sons of El. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly and the far reaches of the north. He says, I will set my throne on the mountain of divine assembly above the sons of God, above the divine council. This is where I will set my throne. And what happens? This is, what, this is what the serpent says. I will ascend. I will govern. I will rule above all other gods. I will be the Lord of all lords. I'll be the king above all kings. He interferes with God's plan, and then God comes to confront the serpent in Genesis 3, verse 14. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. He says, I will throw you down. You are saying that you will ascend. You will be on high. And this is what uh, Yahweh Elohim says. No, you're not going to ascend. I am going to cast you down. And we see this in terms of, of a snake losing its legs. <laughs> Yet having to crawl. And, that's, and, and you see, kids, that's why snakes have to crawl on their bellies and eat dust all day long. Okay? No. We don't see a snake losing its legs being thrown into the dust. We see a serpent being, because of its rebellion, being cast down into the Eretz, into the earth, into the Sheol, into the underworld. He says, you wanted to be above everything that is heavenly, and so I will curse you, and I will put you under the Eretz. I will put you in Sheol. I will put you beneath every creature. You will be thrown down into the cosmic underworld, and now your domain will be the domain of death. You are now the Lord of death, not the head of the divine council. In all three of these passages, this rebellion of this divine being results in it being cast down into the realm of the dead where people are buried. It's called the grave. It's called this cosmic underworld of death. This is the great enemy. That Our God is a God of life and salvation. And his opponent, his enemy, is death. And in Genesis 3, we see that this is the final result of the fall, that humanity loses its contingent immortality. They lose access to Eden. They lose access to the tree and source of life. And God says, you are now destined to die. This is the serpent, the divine being that led to this catastrophe. And God says, I'm going to put this thing beneath the divine world and underneath the human world. Pass this thing down under your feet. You know, a lot of people think that good people go to heaven. The truth is that forgiven people go to heaven. 
The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Yep, the Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're whosoever, yep, and so am I. And isn't it interesting to think that this serpent, whose authority is still at work on the earth today, will one day be completely, totally, finally judged, thrown into a lake of fire. But isn't it awesome to think that by the grace of God, even though we may be tempted, and even though we may fall, the consequences of the first Adam fell on the true and perfect Adam, which is Jesus the Christ. That he, in his perfection, became all of our imperfection so that we could become the righteousness of Christ. That's really good news. Now let me just wrap up with this, just prophetically, okay? If you have the dwelling place of God, that's a pretty squeaky clean place, right? If you have a being that becomes corrupted in the very secret place of God, and that divine being wasn't tempted by a divine being, then how much more vulnerable are humans who live on a fallen earth where there is an enemy that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy? How much more vulnerable are we? Yeah? Then... And that's, and that's, that's the thing that kind of, that, and Pastor Darren, why would you say that? Why am I saying that? Because I think we need to be a little bit more wise. I think we need to be a little bit more shrewd. And I think we need to be a little bit more connected. Why? Because heaven forbid you find yourself talking to a serpent May there be a brother or a sister within the body of Christ that you are knit together with, since we are one body, that you would actually have somebody that would have the courage to love you enough to interfere with your business so that you don't sabotage your identity and your destiny in Christ Jesus. You, know what, you want to know what love does? It, it puts you up in other people's business. You know, if, if you ever have somebody say, that's none of your business. You, you, know, you, you can just say to them, you know what I know what the problem is? I love you. You know what hatred does? It ignores people. You know what hatred does? It says, I, I just need to look out for me. I, I, I am my own. I, I, you can't trust anybody else. Just be this in for yourself. But you know what love does? Love lays your life down for another brother, for another sister. And, and, and I feel like where we are at and where we are going, we're going to have to be a little bit more shrewd than the serpent. A little bit more wise. And, 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 and what I feel like the Lord is doing right now, even within the church, is reminding us that we are a body. And if you hit my little pinky with a hammer, my mouth that didn't get hit by a hammer is going to make a sound. My mouth is going to release a sound to indicate what had happened to another part of my body. You know what happens within the church? A pinky gets hit and the mouth doesn't move. Why? Because the mouth says, that ain't my problem. We have to be a body. We have to think like a body. We have to believe that your problem is actually my problem, which is why Paul said, we need to bear ye one another's burdens. This is what he says, that in the church, we need to look different than the world. Why? Because in the world, they only mind their own business. But in the church, we are a body. We are connected. So we need to think like the beast of burden. We need to think like mules, that we're coming alongside of people spiritually, socially, that we're coming alongside of each other to help bear ye one another's and can I tell you something I think that God is waking us up in this hour I, 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 see, I see in Eden in Australia where there was a serpent that got into the garden just this last week is all over the media and, and the fall of Brian Houston and, and Hillsong and what are they going to do and there are people in the church that will say yeah that's the problem with Hillsong I never liked them anyway 
You know, that was, that was a bad garden. No, that wasn't a bad garden. That was a beautiful garden. Cities and nations have been transformed because of, because of Hillsong. And we see there was a serpent in that garden. Well, thank God there's not a serpent. No, there's a serpent in your garden. There's a serpent on this earth. There's a serpent with authority. There's a serpent with an agenda. There's a serpent. I, I don't want there to be a serpent in my... Yeah, that's part of this era that we live in. This is part of this, this part of our timeline as, as a humanity that there is still a serpent in the garden and we have to think and function and rule as watchmen, as little kingdom police officers with, with, our, with our gun and our badge. And we, we know who we are, and, you know. In the old days, if you ran into a demon, you had to call a pastor we got a pastor over here. And now, yesterday, we did a training for our members. Why? Because we believe that every believer has been given authority from on high to cast out demons, raise, raise the dead, and heal, heal the sick, that freely you've been given, a, freely, freely you receive, you know, you know the verb. <laughs> Just declare, I have authority. I've been given jurisdiction. I have a responsibility to look out, to watch out, to bring this kingdom reality. To see the prayer of Jesus, that, that it would be like this, that Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done, that it would be here as it is in Eden. We do read in Revelation 21 in the New Jerusalem, the Eden 2.0. We see the stones that come back down. We see the, the literal dwelling place of God come back down. But it's not that we have to wait for heaven to come. Why? Paul would say this. Yes, in the natural, a temple has been destroyed. But the new plan of God's redemptive salvation project looks like this. You are the temple. And you don't have to go somewhere to meet with the presence of God. Why? Because you can be filled with the Holy Spirit on high. That you can be a mobile temple. That you are a habitat of glory. That heaven has been seated inside of you. That you have been called by God to walk in the mercy and the justice of heaven and that if you believe you're powerless this morning it's because you believed a lie from a serpent and I came here to tell you this morning that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son to live die resurrect where he's seated at the right hand of the father where he's what where he's making intercession for you and I here and now listen don't you dare be intimidated by no serpent. Why? Because greater is he. Greater is he who is in you. And even now, that serpent is under your feet. <laughs> Let's rise. It's amazing to think that mighty God would share his authority with us and welcome us into this project, into this great Edenic mandate that we would be fruitful and multiply, that we would subdue the earth, that we would see his temple expand, that justice would be done, that heaven would come, and that this would be done through the Sadek, through the righteous. Can we lift our hands in this place? Father, I thank you for this room of sons, this room of inheritors, this room of righteous ones. I thank you for this ecclesia, this room of called out ones. I thank you, Lord, for this room of governing ones that you have planted us and seated us. You have anointed us. You have commissioned us for such a time as this to love and to lead and to pave a way. We thank you, oh God, for the significance of every person in this room right now, for the significance of every family represented here right now. And Father, I thank you. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, no longer subject to the yoke 
of slavery. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that's being deceived, anyone here that's walking in open transgression and sinfulness, that you would just repent right now and say, I'm done partnering with that frequency of death. I repent right now. I step into heaven's perspective. I want to partner with the frequency of shalom, with the frequency of light and peace, with the frequency of Yahweh, Elohim. Satan, I'm sorry. We can't be friends anymore. Transgressor, I'm sorry. We can't be friends anymore. Deceiver, I'm sorry. I'm done deceiving people. Manipulator, I am sorry. I am done manipulating people. It is for freedom that Christ Jesus has set me free. I declare in Christ I am free. I declare in Christ. I am free. I declare in Christ. I am free. Hallelujah. 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 Let's look out for each other. Let's look out for each other. In the natural, let's look out for each other's kids. If you see something sketchy, let's speak up. Let's, let's look out for each other. We are a body. We are a body. We are a body. If you've got sketchy stuff going on inside of you, the Bible says to confess your sin one to another, to, to bring it into the light. If you're being tempted to do something that could harm someone or harm yourself, bring it into the light. Come, come even at, uh, uh, at the end of this service to our prayer ministry team. Bring it into the light. I don't want to partner with the trickster. I don't want to partner with the, with the deceiver. I had a young man come to me several years ago. He said, Pastor Darren, I, I am tempted to engage in unhealthy stuff with children. And I haven't done it, but I'm, I'm worried and I want to confess it. I want to bring it into the light because I don't want to do this thing that, that, my, that my lust has been. I said, thank you so much. We got him accountability and our ushers loved him enough to clear the bathrooms before he would go in. Why? Because we want to create a safe place where people can be honest and open so that Satan cannot use them to hurt and harm others. We bring it into the light. We expose the wickedness of, of the evil one and we create this environment where it's okay to not be okay. Yeah? yeah? Let's guard the garden. Let's guard the garden. Let's guard our homes. Let's guard this church. Let's guard our leaders. Let's guard our children. All right, I'm done. That's good. It's been a long one. I told you it's going to be a long one. If you're online, peace out. See you tonight. We're going to study Paul, the 13th apostle. And uh, see you in a couple weeks, you guys. God bless.